Let me just add my welcome. So glad that you are here today, that we can worship our God together. Uh, we're going to continue doing that as we open up his word, and then we're going to uh, share in communion together. And so as you walked in, if you're with us in person, you should have received those elements. If you didn't, just put your hand up, and one of our ushers will get that to you uh, as we go into God's word now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for this church and for the gift of worship and for this community that you have blessed us with. Father, as we open up your word, would you encourage us, would you guide us, would you lead us closer and closer to you each and every day? We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, uh, I have good news to report from the Scavato house, um, that just in the last week or so, our son Luca has mastered the art of sleeping through the night. We are, yes, thank you. We, we praise the Lord. For that, and uh, I think he's done it maybe four or five nights in a row now. I'm starting to lose track. And of course, now that I share that with you, I fully expect him to be up all night tonight, and it's going to be great. <laughs> Recently, though, I was thinking back to uh, the, the day where we, we brought him home from the hospital for the first time. Some of you know this, that, that he was born early. He spent a, quite a long time in the NICU. And so this was a day that we were really looking forward to for, for quite a bit of time. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, where, where you found yourself looking forward to something for so long, only to be completely unprepared for what comes next. That's certainly where we found ourselves. I remember feeling this way. Maybe if you're a parent, you, you know this feeling of just being overcome with uncertainty and with doubt. Of just thinking, are, are they really going to let us take this person home? Like, shouldn't there be a test we have to take or, or an instruction book or maybe a survival guide? Um, I even asked one of the nurses before we left, like, like what, what do we do? What, what comes next? And I remember she looked at me and she said, you enjoy the journey. And I thought, that's very sweet and also very unhelpful. I, <laughs> I needed more than that. If you've been tracking with us, though, these past uh, couple of weeks, we've been in this series that we're calling By Faith. We've been looking at this uh, Hebrews chapter 11, this faith hall of fame chapter of scripture that reminds us of those that have gone before us and shown incredible faith in uncommon times. People like Noah, who we looked at last week, this person who was willing to follow God's commands even when he was the only one. Even when he faced criticism and questions from everybody in his life other than his family. This is what we're doing this summer, is looking at these pictures of faith that we have been given, not just to learn more about these people, as interesting and great as they are, and not even just so that we can know more about God, although we hope that we do, but that we too would respond to what we see with active, moving, and obedient faith. Not only when we face questions from the world out there, but, but when we too feel overwhelmed and overcome with uncertainty and doubt about what God is calling us to, about this journey of faith that we are on. This is the faith that we will see in our story today as we look to the example of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah stand out for a few reasons, one being that they are the only married couple in our faith hall of fame, two, that Sarah is the first woman mentioned on this list, and three, that they are some of the most important people in all of scripture. In the same way that you cannot tell the story of America without including the founding fathers, you cannot tell the story of the people of God without these two people. In fact, we're told in Galatians chapter 3 that when we live by faith, we are considered children of Abraham. And so today our goal is to look at their example, this example of faith that we have been given, and to consider what it was that allowed them, that gave them the power to, that encouraged them to go on this journey of faith, even as they questioned even as they were uncertain, even as they struggled with doubt. So today, let's head to our Faith Hall of Fame. And let's see what we can learn about the faith of these two people. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, the verses will be up on the screen as well. Hebrews 11, starting in verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. 
For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. This is our example of faith that we look at today. There's just a few things that I want to point out to you in the time that we have together. We see three things uh, that, that their faith does. We see leaving by faith, living by faith, and receiving by faith. Let's start with the leaving by faith. Last week, if you were uh, with us, I mentioned that my wife Judy and I had just uh, passed our seven-year mark, our seventh anniversary. And uh, one of the things that we learned over those years uh, is that we expect very different things when giving each other directions in the car. Now, last week, I talked about how we can't uh, build Ikea furniture together. This week, I'm talking about how we can't drive together. I promise there are things that we can do together, but those don't make very good sermon illustrations. (laughs) I think the key to a happy marriage is avoiding any situation with instructions. There's your marriage tip for the day. I'm sure some of you can, can relate to this, though, where, where if you're going on a road trip, you're going somewhere that, that you don't know, uh, I like to have as much information as possible. Like, I like seeing the map of where we're going beforehand, and I like knowing as soon as I make a turn where the next turn is coming. And Judy likes to do things a little bit differently. So I'll ask her, you know, when, when's the next turn? And, and she'll say, don't worry, I'll tell you. And so I'll go to the left lane, and there's like 100 feet left, and she'll say, turn right, as we fly past the intersection. Now, she might have a different version of the story, but she's not here today, so (laughs) that's what happens. Reading our story today, though, I wonder if Abraham could relate to my frustrations about the directions or the lack of directions that he was given. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12 as we start Abraham's story and we see this faith that we're talking about today. Genesis 12, starting in verse 1, says this. Now the Lord said to Abram, real quick, Abram and Abraham are not two different people. His name was changed at one point in his life. The same thing kind of happened with Sarah. She was originally Sarai, went to Sarah. It was kind of a, a way of God showing his calling on their lives. So same person, don't get confused on that. The Lord said to Abram, go from your, uh, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. And make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 4, so Abram went. As the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. This is the moment that our author is pointing us to. Of God coming to Abraham and saying, if you live by faith. If you step out and walk with me, I will give you this promise. I will give you this land. I will give you this inheritance. You will become a great nation when you live by faith. And we see this put so simply. Look again at Genesis 12, verse 4. That Abraham or Abram went just as God told him to go. He left. He left everything behind, the home that he lived in, the city he belonged to, the people that he was a part of. He left it all simply because God told him to go. And this is the crazy thing. This is the part about this faith that our author doesn't want us to miss. Look again at Hebrews 11 verse 8. That Abraham left not knowing where he was going. He was given no directions, no instructions, not even a hint. Just pack up your bags Take your family and start walking. I'll tell you when to turn. Can you imagine what his neighbors must have thought when the U-Haul pulls up or whatever their version of a U-Haul was and and they start packing everything up? You know, where are you going? What are you going to be doing? Why are you leaving? And this was his response. They must have thought that he had lost his mind. This is the first thing that we see today about faith, that faith has determination even when it doesn't have a destination. This is what we see from Abraham, that that God, I don't know where you're leading me or how you're going to get me there or what it's going to cost me, but you have called me to leave my old life behind, and so you lead the way. I'm right behind you. This is what faith does. 
It identifies anything, anything in our lives that keeps us from our walk with Christ. Every habit, every relationship, every bad decision, and it leaves them all behind. Paul talks about this idea as well. We see it in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This is a picture of the calling that God gave to Abraham, the same calling that he gives to us today. That today, God is calling you to step out in faith, to leave behind all of your old life and your old ways and your old home. Throughout the New Testament, we see this idea that to be in Christ is not just to be a better version of yourself. Living by faith is not just living by a new set of rules, and it's not just giving an hour of your time on the weekends. Faith is not about God making bad people good. Faith is about God making dead people come alive. This is what living by faith says, that the old has passed away, that I am a new creation, completely different than who I was before. It says, if I belong to Jesus, if I'm going to walk with him, then no longer will I talk about people the way I used to, filled with gossip and insecurity and and jealousy. It says, no longer will I think about my money and my resources and my time as my own. No longer will I think about my life with me at the center, but with him on the throne. Why? Because I am a new creation. I have been called to get up and to take my family and to leave my old habits and my old addictions and my old loyalty to the world as I pursue the promises of God. This is the kind of faith and the kind of life that we have been invited into. A life that is sold out in our pursuit of Jesus, no matter where it takes us and no matter what it might cost. This is what Abraham is commended for, for living by faith even in his moments of doubt and even in his times of weakness. This is the the beauty of what we've been talking about throughout this series, that, that these heroes of the faith that we're looking at were not perfect people. They were not superhuman. They were ordinary. Even someone like Abraham, who was called a friend of God, Some of you know this, that after setting out for the promised land, two times Abraham distanced himself from his wife to protect himself, telling others that she was his sister rather than his wife in order that he would not be killed. Now, here's your second marriage tip of the day. Don't do that. (laughs) But we're also told this, and and this really matters for us today, that Abraham's journey was not as simple as it might seem at first glance. In Acts chapter 7, we see this uh, talked about. This is Stephen talking, and he says, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred, and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Now, there are a lot of names and a lot of cities. I don't want to confuse you, but I want to try to make this as as clear as possible. So I brought a map with me today. You can see on the right, that's where Abraham's journey began in a town called Ur. And God calls him to this promised land. He calls him into this journey of faith. And, And what we're told is that for years, he ended up up on the top there in a town called Haran. And while he was there, he spent years there becoming wealthy and growing a home and a family. And this became kind of his place of comfort, even though he was called to this promised land. In other words, this would be like if you went on a plane from Chicago and you were trying to go to Denver and you ended up in North Dakota. Like this was not where he was called to go. And here we see something. That Abraham did something that we in our suburban America might be tempted to do as well. That for years, he missed out on his calling because he settled for comfort. And this is what's so encouraging about Abraham's story, that it's never too late to take a step of faith. It's never too late. Faith is not a test that you either pass or fail. It is a lifelong journey, a pilgrimage, an exploration of who God is. 
It doesn't matter if you've gotten off track or if you've made a wrong turn or if you've gotten stuck where you are. It doesn't matter if you've done something that you can't seem to forgive yourself for. It doesn't matter if you think you're too old or if you think you're too young or if you think you've just made too many mistakes for God to use you. This is what our story shows us is that it's never too late to take a step of faith. The calling remains the same. Leave behind the old. Pursue him, the new creation that he has called you to be. This is living, leaving by faith. That brings us to living by faith, living by faith. Uh, I remember back in high school going with my uh, church to Ukraine uh, for a, a mission trip to teach an English camp in that country. And it was my first experience uh, leaving the country and really experiencing another culture. By the way, it's been heartbreaking uh, to, to hear and read stories from friends that we made on that trip about what they've experienced and, and are still experiencing as they continue to live in this state of war. I remember while we were there, though, uh, walking around the city, and, and while we were uh, doing so, people would come up to us, and they would just say, Americans, and then they would walk away. <laughs> like, they didn't want to talk. It wasn't a question, just Americans. Goodbye. <laughs> And I remember asking one of the missionaries that we were working with, like, like how, do, how do they know? What about us makes it so obvious where we are from? And they told me that it was everything from our clothes that we were wearing to the volume with which we spoke to our attitudes, even the space that we kept between each other. It, they, they could just tell that we didn't belong, that we weren't from there, that, that we were from the U.S., Reading about Abraham here, I think of that story. I think it's a picture of what we see this author of Hebrews talking about. Go back with me to Hebrews 11. We'll pick it up in verse 9. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Do you remember the definition of faith that we gave back in the first week of this series? The definition that we see at the beginning of this chapter? That faith is assurance of what is hoped for. And conviction, evidence of what is unseen. This, according to the author of Hebrews, is the evidence of Abraham's faith. That he was willing not just to leave his life behind and not just to walk with God and not just to lead his family to this promised land, but that he still trusted God when that land was already taken. This is what we're told in the Genesis account that, that Abraham moves everyone and leaves everything. And when they get to where God is leading them, they see that people are already there. This is like if you've ever gone to your, your childhood home and you see someone else is living there. Isn't that just weird? Uh, I did that a couple years ago and, and the owner had like repainted the house and made changes and I was like offended. I was like, that's my house. Anyways, this is the incredible thing though that, that Abraham's faith shows us, that this author wants us to see that throughout his life, Abraham acted as if God's promises were true. Even when he couldn't see the whole picture. Even when the whole map wasn't in front of him. God said, you are going to be the father of many nations, even though you don't have any kids. He said, this land is yours. I promise it to you, even though it has already been claimed. This is what faith is. That for the rest of his life, Abraham lived as a stranger, as an exile, as if in a foreign land that he knew belonged to him. God had promised it to him, and yet we're told that until the day he died, we see this in Genesis chapter 23, that, that the only piece of land that he bought, the only part of the promise that he saw on this side of heaven was a burial plot for him and his family. This is the great tension that we live in when we live by faith, that like Abraham, we too are exiles, strangers, sojourners, those who don't belong. We talked about this last week with Noah as well, how he stood out because he followed God even when no one else understood. He remained faithful to God's commands. And this is a picture of the Christian life, that the same thing is true of us as was true of me when we were in Ukraine, that we just don't belong, that there's something different about us. And so this is the question that we must consider. 
This is the question that the world, the, the culture, our country is asking of the church, especially those in the younger generations. Do we believe and do we act as if that is true? Is there really something different about how we live our lives? Is there really something better about the hope that we have, about how we can offer things in the face of the problems of our world? Is there something compelling about the way that we love our neighbors? Something authentic about how we serve our communities? Is there something irresistible about how we forgive our enemies, care for the hurting, stand for the vulnerable? I asked this question last week. What evidence have we given the world that we are truly living by faith? Abraham lived as if God's promises would come true. He lived as if the impossible would happen, even when he didn't see the whole map. Why? Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says that he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. This is why. Because he was looking forward to another city, a heavenly home, this eternal hope of everything that a city would offer in those days, of, of protection and community and belonging. Everything offered in full. We see this idea talked about uh, throughout scripture, especially in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. It says that I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city. New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. This is where Abraham's eyes were fixed. This is what allowed him to live by faith because he was looking not on his enemies, but on eternity. This is what faith does. Leslie uh, Newbegin, who's a, a British author and theologian and missionary, put it this way. He said, we do not have to know what will happen to us immediately if we know what will happen to us ultimately. This is the faith that Abraham had. A faith that says, my hope is not in what you can do for me down here. My faith does not depend on the blessings you give me. It does not depend on you healing my body. It does not depend on you giving me a perfect spouse or a perfect family. My hope and my faith does not depend on inheriting the promised land down here. Why? Because my eyes are fixed on what is to come. My eyes are fixed on the promise that you have given. My eyes are fixed on where I truly belong. Right now, I'm just passing through as a visitor. For some of us, this is the shift that we need to make, recognizing that faith is not just a way to get God to give us what we want when we want it. In fact, we're told this in Genesis 12, that, that they get to the promised land and they see it inhabited. And instead of getting upset with God or asking why, they, why he brought them to a land that was already taken, Abraham sets up an altar and he worships God. Not just for what he had done, but for what he would do. This is the faith that we're called to today, especially in a season of waiting or of doubt or of uncertainty. To worship God, not just for what he has done, but looking ahead to our eternal hope. That brings us to our last part of this story we see receiving by faith. Receiving by faith. Go to verse 11 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she promised him faithful, or she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Reading this, uh, I was reminded of the day that, that Judy came to me and told me that she was pregnant. 
I remember this just so clearly. We were with our small group, and for some reason we came separately. And so when I got there, uh, she came up to me, and she had this kind of strange smile on her face, and she asked if I could go with her to her car uh, to put her coat away. And I think my exact words were, that is not a two-person job. (laughs) She's very lucky to have me. I, I went, though, and, and so we, we started walking there, and, and I remember her just telling me those words, and I just was overcome with so many emotions. I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. And this is the picture that comes to mind when, when we think about Abraham and Sarah and the way that they responded to what God told them that day. We see this in Genesis uh, chapter 17. God talking to Abraham, he says, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And we see this in chapter 18, Sarah's response in verse 12. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, that's Abraham she's calling old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Look at this, verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. Now, notice this, because it's so important for us to see today. That over and over, Abraham and Sarah had been given a promise. You can see in in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17 that they would have this child, that their line would continue, and that from that line there would be a great nation. That the world would be changed by these two people. And for years and years, they wait for this promise. And nothing happens. Nothing changes. We're told this about Sarah, that she experienced a very specific kind of pain. A pain of being unable to bear children. At this point, they're both too old to expect that to change. We're told this in Hebrews 11, verse 12, where the author refers to Abraham as being as good as dead, which that seems a little harsh to me. But notice this, because sometimes you hear some some weird teaching about this idea, and so I want to just maybe clear some of that up and avoid us getting confused, especially if this is a pain that you are familiar with today. That Sarah's inability to have children was not because of a lack of faith. It wasn't because she didn't believe God enough, not because she messed up or because she was a sinner. If you know someone who is struggling in this way, don't tell them to just have more faith. Be an encouragement with them. Walk with them. Point them back to Jesus as they seek God's will and trust his timing, even in the waiting. This is the faith that Sarah shows us, faith that waits for the promises of God. We're told this, that she waited and waited and waited for for 25 years. All that she had was faith. They tried to do things on their own. You can read about this in Genesis 16, how they came up with this plan for, for Abraham to have a child with Sarah's servant, a woman named Hagar, and that was kind of a cultural uh, solution to this problem, a way to continue the lineage of Abraham. In other words, they tried to accomplish God's promises rather than receive them. Yet another example of how imperfect our heroes of the faith are. But this is what our author is showing us from Sarah's life. That to live by faith is not the same as always being certain. It's not the same as never questioning God, never doubting, never wondering about his plan or even about his goodness. It's the same thing that we saw earlier with Abraham, how this path to the promised land was not a straight line, but a lifelong journey. But this is the hope of what we see here. That when we wait in faith, we see the same thing that God says in Genesis 18, that nothing is too big, too difficult, too impossible for God. This is what faith declares, that by his power and in his timing and for his glory, what Sarah experienced physically is something that I can experience spiritually. That by faith, I have a God who knows how to bring life into any situation. 
He knows how to bring hope from despair. He knows how to bring freedom from strongholds, healing from brokenness, forgiveness from regret. This is who our God is, and this is who we cry out to, and this is who we hope in today. If you find yourself waiting on the promises of God, if you're waiting for something to change, hoping that he will do what he said he would do in your life. It's what Sarah is commended for, this moment where she went from doubt-filled, bitter laughter to what we're told in Genesis chapter 21. Do you remember how the story ends? That the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, who Sarah bore him, Isaac, which means laughter. This is the hope of the gospel, that out of bitterness, he brings joy. Out of brokenness, he brings healing. And out of our steps of faith, he can change the world. This is what we see in verse 12, that as much as they had been promised, they could not imagine what was to come, that it would be easier to count grains of sand on the beach and stars in the sky than measure the impact of their faith. And this is the last thing I want you to see from the story. That from Isaac, who we're going to talk about next week, there came Jacob. And from Jacob came 12 sons who became 12 tribes, which would become one nation. And from that nation would become a lineage to another baby boy born in another unbelievable way. And that Jesus would change history and change eternity. See, here's the last thing that we see, that living by faith could change the world but it will change your world. This is what we are called to. Not to become mothers and fathers of the nations, but for our faith to be blessings for our kids. Not to lead to a great nation, but to be good neighbors in our communities and in our cities. This is what the faith of Abraham and of Sarah shows us. The faith that points us to Jesus. That's what we're gonna do now. We're going to remind ourselves of what Jesus did on our behalf as we take time to come to the table for communion. You can grab those elements now. We uh, believe here at Chapel Street that, that the communion table is for anyone living by faith. And if you are following Jesus today, we would love for you to join us in this way. And so you can take these and you can take that top layer off as we think about and reflect on uh, the night that Jesus was betrayed and he was with his disciples. He was with his disciples and he took bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this and remember me. Let's eat together. You can take that second layer off. As we're told on that same night after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. A promise that we have been given that when we live by faith, that his promises will come true, that we are never alone and we have a heavenly city to look forward to. Drink this and remember him now. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the hope and the encouragement and the promises in your word. Lord, we know for many of us, there are things that you have called us to leave behind and And for those, I ask that you would give us strength. Lord, for others, we know that we've been struggling to to live according to your word, to live in a way that shows evidence of our faith. Would you guide us? Would you allow us to do so? But Father, right now, I wanna pray for those who are waiting on the promises of God, who have been experiencing the, the pain of waiting and of not knowing and of trusting. And Lord, it can be so difficult. Father, now as we come to you in worship, as we consider what you have done on our behalf already, would you strengthen our faith? Would you remind us of who we are and how you've created us and the promises that you have given us and the faithfulness that you have shown? Allow us to live in those promises as we wait on you. We pray this in your name, amen.